Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Adoption Unfiltered. Um, I'm Kelsey Vanderbilt Ranyard. I'm a birth mom. We have also with us Sarah Easterly, an adoptee, and Lori Holden, an adoptive parent. And our esteemed guest today is Claudia Corrigan Darcy. Um, she's a birth mother and a really like a trailblazer, as I see it, in adoption advocacy, reform advocacy and um in birth parent advocacy which is uh not as big of a corner and so claudia has been very very loud and uh, for for decades and and one person that i really have have treasured and looked up to um especially in my work she has the blog musings of the lame adoptionbirthmothers.com um, for 19 years now and so this was a website for me personally where you could read anything and everything about the birth parent experience and about adoption um, realities and so yeah so welcome Claudia we're so excited to have you thank you I I did not expect that that was almost going to make me cry so thank you <laughs> <laughs> of course yes we're so excited no. Um, to have you and to talk about, you know, kind of that, that lane of advocacy that you, you really have, um, you know, forged a path on. Uh, I don't want that to be, I'm not even, I'm not even buttering you up. Like I'm so serious. Um, it's, it's really valuable because um, I'm seven years post placement. And so we're not, and we, you and I have talked about this. Um, a little bit about how birth parents were not super organized um, for advocacy. And so we kind of rely on these little gems of our network of connecting and finding community. And um, it can be kind of a tough space to be in. So, but I really appreciate your work. I really appreciate your voice and all of the, I mean, to have a blog for, for almost 20 years, that's a big, big deal. Um, a lot of people come into this space it's very overwhelming and they give it up and they go but um this is tenacity and perseverance that I really respect so yeah thank you again I mean I, I, you know <laughs> to be honest I have definitely taken my breaks right because that sure. is definitely very and um I also haven't written much worth substance for quite some time. So there's that too. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I never thought this is where I'd end up being, right? Yeah, no, I'm with you there. I feel the same. Um, so we kind of just wanted to learn, like tell our listeners more about yourself and your work and, and kind of just tell us what you've learned in your years of advocacy. So I guess, gosh, it's just so much, right? Um, I guess the main thing that I've learned is, gosh darn, it is hard work. <laughs> and it can very much be exhausting, um, right? That, that, that definitely, I, I, wow, that part is, is hard. Um, but it has been absolutely the most worthwhile. Right. And, and, and I joke and I say, I really don't know how I got here. Um, because really the reality is I, I took the worst mistake in my life and somehow or another, I've managed to make it into a career, which sometimes is just really yucky. Right. So it's still, no matter how much work you do and no matter where you end up being, it's almost like the film of adoption doesn't wash off. So it's it's still kind of yucky sometimes, right? Um, there's so many pieces of it, right? And there's so many, so many of us are so hurt. And I think that makes it also just so hard. We work, we live in this space where it's constant. And, and that is why it is exhausting. I think when people, you know, are like, okay, I need a break right? I can't do this all the time because we're not made to be like this all the time. And adoption gives us an all the time that is, that is not normal and not natural. So yeah, it's, um, but I always say, you know, I, the first thing I ever Googled literally was adoption and, you know, here I am. 
it's 23. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think it's, it's also, do you think that we as a community, as a birth parent community, how do you see us as different from the adoptees in their community and even adoptive parents in their community? How do you see us as, as different? Cause I, I have my own opinions, but I, I'm really eager to hear yours. Well, I, I, I think we get like, well, like anyone, any of us in adoption, right. Adoption across the board. I think no matter what, accepting it and, and looking at adoption in all its many, many facets, right, is extremely difficult for any of us because most people, we, we, nobody learns this, right? Like, we know that nobody learns it. Media doesn't give us accurate stories. You know, the narrative is is just, you know, rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. And we all learn too late, right? And this is where adoption, I think, does a disservice across the board. It tells adoptive parents what they want to hear. You know, it tells adoptees what they want to hear to placate them or what we want to hear from them is more like it to continue the storyline. And it tells birth parents what we want to hear too, right? When we're faced with these remarkable decisions and, and, and you know, horrible choices and tragic consequences, you know, it does across the board, all of us. And so, we all go into this thing, but it's like what it affects on us on adoption is like such a core level, right? It's the foundation of who we are as people. I mean, for adoptees, it is who you are as a person, no choice there. You know, for adoptive parents, you've you've made a, a choice and you've based your whole life family, your, your building of everything on this. And then for birth parents, we're pretty much the same, right? Monumental life choices that affects everything. And now we have to figure out that it wasn't as great as everyone thought it, they told us would be like, that is a huge jump, right? So nobody wants to do this. And I think it's really, really hard. I mean, I think it's easier in some ways for adoptees to jump out of that spot and, and out of that, you know, happy narrative because they live it, right? They know it doesn't feel good. And 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 they didn't have the choice, right? Like they have the choice of either seeing one way or seeing another way or, you know, however it is, processing, not processing, you know, you have your choices there, but you don't have a choice about whether or not you want to be an adoptee, you're just stuck. So but the other two parties, like we have to come to determination and, and come to live with the fact that we did this. And usually the thing that we did results in harming the adoptee, which is the and person that you're not supposed to harm in any which way or form, right? Like that's And like, that's also really not important. revered by society in any way, shape or form. So I think whereas like the adoptive parents, they did this too, right? But this is, this is like held in high esteem, whereas our thing is both very uncomfortable to face with ourselves, with our family, with our child, with the world around us too. I mean, that's a, it's a huge thing to take responsibility for and look at your life and say, oh shit, <laughs> you know? Oh God, yeah. what do I mean, yeah. I still go. Why did I ever think it was a good idea to give my baby away to strangers? Sure. sure. What the fuck was I thinking? Sure. Yeah. You have to edit that one because I can say what no. the heck thinking. No, we're too. all adults here. Well, we're all adults here. We'll put the parental yeah. advisory sticker yeah. on it. No worries. But and I, I think with birth parents then, like, you know, we get, we're so so much is built into believing right the fairy tale and, and and what you know like it has to be true right like it has to be okay because well now we're stuck in it and like we don't really have another choice and and, and i think like you know just watching you know in birth mother groups year after year after year mother after mother coming through the doors sure. saying the same things over and over again right like is it going to be like this? And, and, and what can I do to make it better? And, and I didn't expect it to be this hard and why aren't they answering my calls and, you know, how come they're not sending the photos and, you know, so just the, I, the loss adds, I think with birth parents mm -hmm. over as it does also with adoptees. Um, 
but they don't know at all often what they're missing, right? Like, and, and mm -hmm. I think we do as birth parents and we have that imagination, right? Because it is a real sure. person. Sure. We're missing a real tangible human being from our lives. And and I just think there's just like so much pain, right? There's so much pain yep. and so much trauma. And, and, and it's very hard, I think, for people to not make it about them. And, and I think to do this work in any true capacity, like we have to kind of be able to take ourselves out of like where we are emotionally and kind of look at the really big picture. Um, Cause I know many times like that has been the only thing that steered my advocacy work, right? Cause if it was about yeah. how I was feeling, <laughs> I should have been out the door. Um, but yeah, I, I think for birth, it's just really hard to get to that point and yeah to realize just how incredibly duped we've been, right? How used, how duped and to figure out a place to go from there. Um, Cause yeah. there's so much, you know, it's. I love what you said about not making it about ourselves too, because um, I think on a lot of sides, you in any, in any experience, whether they they're like, they're saying they had the most wonderful experience or the worst. I think that that, that aspect of projection comes across in many forms um and it really prevents us from seeing the person sitting across from us and what they need and um and understanding them and and you know building a relationship with them when we're making it about ourselves and I think we've all probably been guilty of that too but it's such a good reminder especially in advocacy work because you there's such an advantage when you've been personally affected by this and you have a passion for um, making change and you, you know, you have good ideas or good networks or whatever your strengths are. Um, it's, it's a great thing to be personally affected by it because it makes you all the more powerful. But at the same time, when that's the only thing that you can see is your own experience, it's super limiting. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't get much done because you can't get strategic if you're reactionary right? Yes. Yes. Going on the emotional parts, which, you know, there's a lot of, right. Yeah. But um, getting out of that button. So. Yeah. So how have things changed in your, in your time working in this, working well, towards this? <laughs> it's funny. I was actually just uh, selling someone the other day and I forget who about, and, and Lori, you'll think, remember fondly, of this of back in the days of um you know when adoption.com was the only forum in town and i was explaining to someone that you literally could not go on the forum and post in any which way or form anything negative about adoption at all there was no birth parents there was like very few adoptees there it was mostly adoptive parents in various forms or another and if i remember going on and being like yeah you know as a birth parent mm, didn't feel so good and people were like what what do you mean that adoption hurt you like they couldn't even grasp that as a birth parent i suffered a loss and it was crazy. It was like, and I used to, oh my God, remember I would get banned on site like for like a year and a half. Like if they figured I had more fake profiles and anytime I'd go on and they figured out it was me and that, I mean, honestly, I, I probably learned right then and there to how to be like really, really careful with my language and my writing so that it could be accepted. I mean, it was a wonderful proving ground, right? But, um, oh, but you couldn't say anything, period. So, you know, now, wow, what a different world we live in, right? Like so many wonderful strides have been made where people are not just having the conversations everywhere, but it's accepted, right? Like people do not go running, screaming to the hills anymore. Or, you know, or if they just say like, oh, yes, I relinquish my child to adoption, they don't go, oh, how cool which literally has happened before. Um, you know, it's, people really, I, I think it's amazing, amazing the strides. And 
it's just it's night and day, right? That now that there's conversations, there's you know huge groups with thousands of people. Like you know, um, like I always say, adoption facing realities on Facebook is like the absolute best adoption group I've ever seen in you know the two and a half decades I've been doing this work, and it is just chock full of people saying those getting it, getting it, and then learning and being open to learn and then going out and talking to others and educating others. And I mean, it's just, it makes, just makes my heart. <laughs> like it makes me really just feel so good. I feel like, like we planted seeds, right? Like seeds were planted. And now, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't try to go any everywhere anymore. Right. I don't have to be in every conversation because there's so many other just people blooming and doing it. So, I mean, that part of it is just, it's incredible, right? It, it's just really, it's incredible. Is it enough? No. Um, have we made huge strides? No. Could we be a thousand times farther than we are now if we stopped eating our own and fighting and infighting? And yeah. Um, is it going to happen? Probably not, right? <laughs> That's the reality probably not but um but yeah i mean it's it's it, it makes me sad because we really are incredible when we work together right like those 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 miracles when when all the parties have come together and honestly i mean and I, i'll say to the cow comes home in the book the fact that there's three of you into the book that's the power in it right there right boom that's how we're getting the message across because i know for a fact people will hear Lori. And they won't hear anybody else, but they'll hear her. And that's where, you know, so we got to, you know, being strategic, right? Looking at those things, making, you know, the discussions about like, you know, I tell people all the time, they're like, we need to change this law. We need to change that law. No, we need to enforce a lot of the laws that we have, right? Or 100%. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> right? Voice yes. and Enforce the laws that we have and um, make the courts actually withhold them. Yes. Um, you know, make them enforce open adoptions because it, it can happen if we're not yep. so scared and scared hiding under rocks. Yes. Licking our wounds and saying, poor me. Yes. Enforceability yeah. to be present and accessible. I mean, uh, we've, uh, in my work we've been writing and it's so much work that's the other thing so much involved we targeted um a couple states what well, we we came up with a list of six states that we wanted to target for their enforcement because they had good laws they had penalties attached we were like let's focus on six we got two letters written the amount of work that we had to do to get those two letters written the 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 people we wanted to sign them and then to navigate those enforcement mechanisms of, oh, well, in Virginia, you have to talk to the commissioner who then talks to this person and then this person. And we're like, what the fuck is going on? Like, it's not what people think it is where you call somebody. There's nobody to call. Like, and you think, oh, I'll just contact the attorney general. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? There's a hierarchy to the attorney general's office. And if you get in at the ground floor, you're never going to make it up unless it's like a totally newsworthy story. So you have to get in at the top, utilize your contacts. I mean, it's just, everything is politics. Every, every, everything is politics. And so we got two states and we're like, we feel like we ended 2023 with two letters going out for two states. And we were like, that's a win. And we were yeah. making really good traction in two states too. Um, a lot of, the other thing is a lot of people don't, aren't aware of these problems. And, and they're so nuanced and that you have to do a really good job of explaining how this is breaking the law, how, you know, and it's different for every state. We have 50 different states, uh, 50 different sets of state statutes. So it's, it's so convoluted. <laughs> it's such a, we have such a fragmented, um, you know, non-central government framework. It is such a mess all the time. And I don't think people realize Man, if we would just work together, I think we'd get things done, period. But I think things would move a lot faster because oh, I can't do everything in every state and neither, you know, can my team, you know, yeah. neither can and you. <laughs> the, 
And that's the thing too, right? I mean, I think that's yeah. also what in our community is when you do have people who do step up, right? And, and, I, and I'll say this for anybody who's listening, no one is going to say it, give you an engraved invitation to help. If you nope. think something needs to change, come on board the train. Yeah. Because we got work to do, right? Like, oh, let's open invitation. Exactly. Even, I think everybody has talents. Everybody has strengths. I'm like, come, please, please, whatever what you can offer, please. Exactly. And what's important to you, right? Because you can't do everything, right? Yep. And that's the um, you know, you get the people who rise to the top and they're like focusing on what they feel is their thing that they can do. And yeah. then, you know, every brother, the armchair quarterback starts saying, well, you should be doing this and then you should be doing oh, that. Yeah. They're like, oh. well, what are you going to do about, uh, well, well I, I understand that you're doing adoption reform, but why aren't you doing anything about our capitalistic system? Or, <laughs> like, or my doing um, the OB. <laughs> Yeah, doing OBCs and we'd be like, okay, we're doing, you know, this state is happening. They'd be like, when are you going to come to here? I'm like, I, I, oh I, I you go there, you do it in your <laughs> state. That's how it works. <laughs> you live there, it's your state, you know, yeah. you go do it and um, I'll come yeah. help if you it, right? You know, I'm here. But, yes, that's no, what I just... always tell people too. I'm like, I have model bill language. Do you want it? go set up a, a meeting with a legislator and I will give you the bill link. I will hand it to you on a silver platter, please. Well, but I can't unspe- do it. I can't set up a constituent meeting with a, a rep in Georgia. I live in California. Like they're not going to talk to me. You know, they don't want- and they I definitely I think- don't want to talk to someone from California. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's one of the challenges too, is, is, you know, when people do get to the point, and, and I think, you know, there's a cycle, right? Like mm-hmm. first, you know, you're, you're whatever the, however you get into adoption, right? Mm-hmm. And and then you have to, you know, the blinders come off and, and, and then you're realizing, okay, there are problems. And then you go through your, you know, all your emotional feelings to get to the point where you're like, yeah, I'm going to do something about this. And the problem is we're constantly getting newbies, right? Sure. Who are like, oh, this is crazy. Let's do something. And you're like, Yes. We've thought of that before. Thank you. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yes, that is a great idea. And it's been thought of like eight times. And you don't want to discourage them, but also sure. you have to be like, had one. Yes, we've done that. It doesn't work. Right. And, and but then people don't want to be told that either. Right. So it's very difficult to exist in a space. Mm-hmm. Um and when you get into the legislative part with the policies, I always love this one because you know, you get to people where people will be in a position of leadership and they'll be holding lots of, of bits of information. And unfortunately, when dealing with legislators, sometimes you got to keep that information under wraps, right? You can't yep. tell, you can't tell the whole community, no matter how transparent you really want to be, you can't mm-hmm. because you're going to blow stuff up, right? So you got to mm-hmm. keep your, you know, you got to keep some crap under your hat for a while. Mm-hmm. But because we are so traumatized as a community, we are so hyper vigilant, mm-hmm. and we take right. Someone, it, it, uh, every I swear to God, every major blow up I think in adoption land has almost always happened because of trust, the hyper vigilance of trust, and people being like, they're holding something back. I don't know what they're doing. Something's on. It's going on. Something's weird. I don't trust them, that person. And then that's it. And then they're triggered. Off we go. Yeah. You know, train has left the station. And you can't tell that person, dude, your adoptee trigger is bad or your birth parent trigger. You know, you're just, no, no. bye. Yep. That happens to me. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but every once in a while, it's, you know, I can't tell you everything that I'm doing because if I tell you and you tell your friend and then it gets around because you know how fast things get around also in our community we're playing telephone all day long (laughs) with each other and um I mean I'm a part of that too I do it all the time but you know I can't I cannot tell you certain if I'm pursuing enforcement in Alabama which I'm not right now not yet um don't I can't go tell you. And then what the Alabama brokers and whoever else they close, they, they go underground, which they will do. Absolutely. They will do it. 
they've done it before. Um, so then, then I have no more evidence and then, then I'm screwed. I can't tell you that stuff. Um, but then also I, I get on the other end of it where, you know, we all, we all have trust issues and we're all looking, we're all looking to spot the grifter and, uh, you know, I get it. And how do you tell someone that you're not that? <laughs> I don't know. Not sure I yet. don't know. Right. Like, I don't know. Like I've gotten very, uh, you know, mythologies over, over the years, you know, of, of, you know, okay, fine. I'm just going to do this thing. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, that's what you best you can do. Right. Yeah. Like anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, we just keep through our actions and our results, keep building trust that way um but knowing that 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 may not be enough and that's okay we've got to be okay with that I guess and, and I think that is right like that's the absolute you know, radical acceptance of of where we are right as a community where we are individually in our lives due to adoption doing its thing on it right like certain things you can't change no matter what it's just what it is you know the radical acceptance of adoption itself as an institution right like it isn't just like raising your regular kids it's not it's a totally different animal and until we can get you know the world to accept that we're still going to be pushing up a little battle, right? Because we're going to always have that narrative coming down on us again. We're always going to have to be sweeping it away. But I mean, honestly, it's, it, you know, it's going to be here, right? Like it's always going to exist in some form and we're always going to have to deal with, you know, a kids who actually really do need homes, but then people wanting to participate in, in adoption for whatever their reasons are. And, and then people coming in and starting again, you know, wanting to reinvent the wheel where he's like let's not reinvent the wheel we got lots of wheels there are actually there's great wheels right now and, and like that's the thing is like we have some really you know there's great things happening right and if we could come together more as community and get behind those things that are happening and and you know really stop diluting our efforts mm -hmm. and, bring, and bringing people down for trying oh yeah I'm, yeah. I'm so glad, Claudia, that you mentioned your earlyadoption.com days, because that's the first time that we intersect. Yes. And um, part of my presence here with Kelsey and Sarah today, with the book Adoption Unfiltered, can be traced back to our interactions there, where you were finding ways to make your experiences palatable to somebody fresh as an adoptive parent like me. And um, it speaks so much to what we wanted to do with Adoption Unfiltered, which was talk together, uh, understand each other. Um, and you got that really early. Um, and in fact, I remember I got to the, the first time I got to meet you um, was at a bloggers conference a couple of years after I started reading your blog. And I don't know if you remember what you said to me, but you said um, there are other pe there were other adoption bloggers there who might want to spit on you for talking to me because that kind of the wounding, the, the, the hurt that adoptive parents have caused um, makes it so that you can't talk to people who, who maybe you should talk to. So thank you for talking to me all those years ago. Well, thank you for talking to me because I always say, I'm like, you know, I'm like, no, Lori, Lori was like the best ever. She got it and look at what she's done, right? I mean, like, and, and to me, it's, like wonderful to see right I just all of it um because those were crazy days yeah, we and talked it, about the seeds and you you were one of the yeah. seeds for me so I wanted to make sure that I I got a chance to say that well you for me are a beautiful beautiful flower <laughs> thank you so yeah now this I mean it's it's really is hard though I think because so many people are you know hurt and then the concepts are continuously painful right and and processing the whole thing is i mean it's a lifetime for everybody um because it never stops because it affects our entire lives so it's just i mean people get exhausted and they say you know i want to be done with this but can't escape ourselves 
I had another question for you. Um, you have found yourself for the last several years working in the industry and you're an activist. How do you reconcile those two things? Because I know Kelsey's going through that as well. I don't have to deal with that, but um, the rest of you kind of do. How can you be part of something that you don't approve of? You know, it's it's interesting. And I, I, I definitely know that um, it counts as black mock against my character in some circles, which is fine, right? Like I understand that. Um, and the reality is, you know what? I, at this point in time, I do pay my bills because of adoption, right? And and that is true. And I would not be here except that I'm a birth parent, right? So basically, yeah, my bills get paid off of my son's back. That is the reality, right? Is it something that is good? No. Um, and then I often say, if I was going to be completely emotionally healthy, I would probably have to find another job soon. Um, but I'm not. <laughs> but um, it is difficult, right? Uh, the one thing that that I do feel is it's vital for me, vitally important, is that you know, at the coalition, we don't promote adoptions, right? We don't we don't make them happen. We are not a child placing agency. Um, we don't do almost anything on the front of an adoption, except for information and and even the 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 quality the the. The narrative of that information has changed drastically over the last few years. Um, you know, even like one of the things, you know, just as a matter of fact, and and it's funny because I struggle with this, right? As an information purveyor, which is what I like to think of myself as doing, you know, I give people information. Um, I also like to collect information. I, I'm a, a data hoarder, right? <laughs> Love to have all the information that there is. So one of the things that we're talking about at the coalition is just removing the directory page completely that has the you know list of adoption agencies in New York. Because we don't necessarily at all even want to tell people where to find them. But of course, now the data part of me is like, oh, but that makes us less relevant to Google. <laughs> so I'm actually internally struggling that way professionally, you know, marketer hat versus birth parent hat, right? Um, but yeah, it, it's really, it's, it's about what we do there, right? And um, I believe in the work that we do because it is mostly post-adoption work, right? So, you know, for the adoptees, for the adoptions that happen anyway that are there, um, you know, at least there is a, a benefit, you know, there is that support for parents. There is that education for parents. I mean, I mean, to be honest, I, I took the job, my original position at the coalition because of the New York state bill. Right. Like New York State, we had our OBC bill in 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 Albany um, for years and I was actively fighting that. And this was the New York State Adoptive Parent Association. And well, if I worked for them, wouldn't be that hard to make sure that Albany knew that New York State's adoptive parents supported the OBC bill. So, you know, I, the reality is I like to think of myself as a little bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing. And truthfully, you know, Claudia, the loudmouth birth mother blogger from New York, she got some shit done. She got a lot of trouble caused too, right? Um, Claudia, the associate executive director of communications of the Adoptive and Foster Family Coalition of New York, gets more done. I'm more effective this way. Um, I'm more effective behind my computer. I'm more effective you know, not just putting out a single blog post every day, but, you know, putting on a, a conference every year, you know, where I get, you know, a couple of hundred people in one room. And then they think not only, not only do I get to hand pick what it is that, that we think that they really need to hear to push that envelope, to get them to the next step, to, you know, to be what they need to know about, you know, their children or whether it's transracial adoptees or, you know, adoptee voices or, you know, or this is, you know, this is traumatizing or, you know, whatever the heck it is that, you know, makes them create more harm, basically, you know, like that's the thing. Mm -hmm. We can stop some of the harm in adoption from the beginning but once we're at the end you know once we're already there we can't just throw these kids out to sea and say oh well sorry missed you we couldn't prevent it so have fun no everybody still needs support um yep. 
And, and so like that work is just really, you know, it's really valuable. So I feel like, you know, it's still stuff that needs to get done. And, um, you know, on a policy level, I'm definitely much more effective. Um, on an educational level, you know, I'm more effective because I basically cloaked a whole bunch of adoptive parents around my voice. It's like an amplifier, right? I, I'm with you. I, I think the power that I have as a policy director at a nonprofit like once you also in just legislation, once you learn how stakeholder networks are utilized in creating new laws, the fact that I can send a letter signed from the, the director of policy at ethical family building, it's it, it runs circles around Kelsey Vanderblade, lone birth mother in California. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, yes. now those grassroots level stuff is still so important, but they're important in numbers um not important so much they, they're not not important but they are less uh powerful in you know when when not mobilize and organize those groups um but but yeah the power to write a letter sign my name this is my status it's massive i mean it's not even comparable no it's it's not even comparable Right. Like, so that's yeah. literally why I, I stay where I am. I mean, you know, one of the things um, we just we just had the governor veto a f bill for a third time, which honestly, at this point in time, it's just such a stupid bill. I, I don't even care anymore about it. But it's led into other discussions about um, open adoption law in New York. And, oh, and we that. Right. And uh, interestingly enough, and I, I'm embarrassed to actually say this, but it looks like it looks like an early 20 or 21. And I forget what now from my notes. Um, we actually did change the law in New York and the 30 day revocation period looks like it went away. And I can't find the source bill yet. Yeah, this is interesting, right? I, I did find um, there was a court recommendation, right, from the court saying, it was very favorable saying, you know, basically like, open adoption isn't enforced, right? Like it's only enforced in New York if they file the content, you know, the post-adoption mm -hmm. contact agreement at right. the time of finalization. And it doesn't happen a lot doesn't happen all the time right so the court was recommending they were saying okay well we think it needs to be the same judge number one the judge needs to take the relinquishment and oh by the way yeah we don't want you to do relinquishments anymore at the adoption agency you know offices it needs to be a judicial relinquishment in front of a judge because we want the judge to tell you all these things like they were tightening up but it's interesting you know we were talking before about legislation and how so how it's like interpreted so, of course, there's provisions in it where you could still do a non judicial relinquishment mm -hmm. with witnesses. And you have to sign a waiver saying that you don't you can't you can't go in front of the judge. And I'm like, ooh, like the agencies, you know, are still going to use that. And they're going to say to mothers like, oh, well, you can go in front of a judge, but, you know, you really don't need to. But if you sign this, you can just do it in the office and it's just so much easier. And of course, then moms no, aren't going to know any better. We're going to sign the waivers for, you know, our rights to go in front of a judge and make sure that the judge tells us that we have a right to have our own attorney. Like, good stuff. Um, and the other reason we're doing it is, and then they're saying that the same judge has to be on both ends. So the judge knows that if you relinquished, you know, you consented to relinquish and you did have a post-adoption contact agreement, he's going to know to carry it over into the finalization of the adoption. So stuff like that, that's the stuff that like, a needs to be talked about, right? Because the agencies, sure. like, and so moms coming in, they're not going to know, like, the difference between, like, you know, the different, because who does? I mean, I had to look it up 15 times, and it's still confusing. Um, but, like, that's the kind of stuff that, like, you know, we can do on on a policy level and really push that and 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 make those changes and say, like, you know, okay, like, why aren't we enforcing these things? Because it's there. Yep. The law says this, and right. now you got loopholes close those loopholes i'm with you i think that there's so many there's like a laundry list of things that we could do um and very feasible extremely feasible um policy ideas that that yeah. could be brought to reality 
So, yeah. So I appreciate that. Sarah, do you have any? Yeah, Claudia, I, I would love to go back just a little bit um, to what you were saying, the awareness of that you're you're making a living off your son's back. And I really appreciate you saying that and just that mindfulness. But I also I also just want to say, I guess I'm curious what his thoughts are, because when I am in the space with all three of you, I'm looking in the room. I mean, um, I'm glad you're modeling for other birth parents and other adoptive parents. And you listen to adoptees, you advocate, you're modeling to them how to be open in your grief and your mistakes and how to learn and how to grow. I'm just curious what, you know, how your son feels and if you have hard conversations or if, you know, what, what's it like for him just and your relationship together with all of the work and advocacy that you do? See, it's, um, you know, I would say at this point in time, it, it's funny because obviously I'm, I'm a birth parent and I will always be a birth parent, right? I can't undo the past, but we don't really live with it anymore, right? Because he's literally above my head, right? So he's been home for almost three years now. Um, you know, we, we don't really have adoption anymore in our lives, except that we don't have that past, right? And it's funny because we have, it's, it's, just, it's just part of everything at this point, you know, because we've lived in adoption for so long. I never am out of adoption. You know, my one son does this joke where he puts his glasses on my, my, my glasses on his face and goes, my name is Claudia, adoption, adoption, adoption. Um, now he throws in some narcissists just for fun. Um, so yeah, so, you know, when he was younger, um, I used to always, and when he wasn't living here, you know, I would always warn him whenever, you know, something was happening, like, oh, I've been asked to talk to, you know, this person on this radio show, okay? Um, and, you know, he always said, like, yeah, go give him Helma, right? Um, you know, go get him. And, and, and it's funny, because, like, he, I think even, like, you know, going to, like, Massachusetts and doing the OBC work up there, um, you know, we, I made him go to the bill signing. <laughs> And I tease him, right? And like he's like, ah, I'm not, thank God it's done. I don't want to do these anymore, right? So it's like I, I see it as stuff that he sees that he does for me, right? Um, and 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 he does, really. That is the reality of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if we've actually even had the conversation about like, oh, I make my job because of this, right? I mean, I've just said it because it is just reality. Um yeah. Because it is, right? Like that's I almost feel like there's a, a redeeming quality that some of us who enter into adoption not knowing better pursue when it's like, okay, I caused, I did something that led to harm for somebody. I can't make it directly right, but how can I make it indirectly right? And so, you know, I wonder if that's partly of, of how that squares for you. Oh, I, I, I own that one with a 12 foot pole. Yeah, no, that's definitely, it's a, I would say it's definitely been a, a, a total path of, you know, proving, proving like, yes, oh yes, I get it. Right. I, I did wrong. Right. Let me, let me fix this mistake. I mean, that was, let me fix it. Right. Literally that's the words that I've used. Like fix adoption is still my Gmail, it's still my email that I don't ever check, right? Um, but what I say, I wanted to fix it, you know, and to fix the OBC in Massachusetts, because that was the only thing that I could fix for my kid and undo for real. Um, yeah, the definitely, without a doubt. And and I think, and I, and I think part of it too is, you know, I mean, I see, and I get lots of arguments with people about this one, you know, I like being angry, right? Bad things happened to us. They should not have. I was failed by, you know, myself. True, right? Like I eat my piece of pie, what I did, but, you know, but I was failed by other people and, and you know, it makes me angry, right? And so anger is a wonderful fuel as far as I'm concerned. And, and you know, I could turn that anger on myself and, and beat myself up for the next million years, but what good is that going to do really? I can't undo the past, right? So you could sit there and live in the past and be miserable forever or whatever. But the one thing you can do is you can change the future, right? You can change the future, maybe not even just for you, but for other people. And, and so that's just really, you know, I, it is the long view, right? It is, it is the big picture. And, and, and it's also, I think the other thing too, which is important as far as, 
there's like the whole looking at and redeeming oneself. Um, but I think there's also the fact, like going back to accepting, like, I can't undo it, right? This pain is there. It's in my life. It's in my child's life. Like I, it, I've let it permeate everything, you know, it's it, cause it's adoption. Um, and it didn't do us any good, right? Like the whole concept, right? The whole, the whole mythology around being a birth mother is that you, you know, like I knew that it was going to hurt, right? Like I didn't have any, like I, 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 I was prepared to be miserable and I was, it did not, it did not disappoint. <laughs> relinquishment yeah, did not it was definitely miserable but the whole concept is that you take the sacrifice as a birth parent right you take the hit because in adoption of course you are also the threat right so the child you know and and it plays off you know the whole mama bear like parents will do anything for their child we will sacrifice anything for our children we will you know we want our children to have a better life than us no matter what and it takes that and it twists it because then the thing that is the threat to the child is ourselves and so we literally stab ourselves in the back willingly take the hit you know because it will free our child to like be free from the lights of us as a parent. And we do that willingly. And then at one point or another, not only is it way more unbearable than we possibly ever could have imagined because it does, but not only that, but our children aren't better, right? It doesn't make it better. It doesn't fix the problems. It's not the end all be all. And wow, everyone isn't living happily ever after in some forever family, really. I mean, sometimes it does, right? Sometimes you can maintain that longer, but sometimes you just really can't. Eventually the cars fall down. And, and I think that piece of it is just so like, you can't get rid of it. So at least being public with that pain, using it to, you know, using that anger as a fuel to drive you know, the, the fights and the battles and, you know, picking one up and, and getting one. Because at least then the pain became useful. I was able to put it to good use. It wasn't worth nothing. Like I had to live with it. My poor kid had to live with it. But at least it's done something else besides make us cry. And so I'll be loud. That's so powerful. And I think that's something I definitely needed to hear because, yeah, I think you can get that criticism too, like, and, and it always is a pile on, right? It's never like a one-off thing. You're like, oh, it's going to avalanche on you. <laughs> um, but I think it's so powerful to hear because, yeah, I, I'm not going to, that's that's totally my position too, is like, I, this, I always thought like, don't waste this. Um but I think it's it's a deeper concept than just not wasting your life or your your post you know relinquishment life. It's it's um you know it's the the, the broader concept of like leaving things better than you found it, and um, you know and and I definitely am fueled by anger because anyone that works with me will be like oh yeah Kelsey's an angry. <laughs> a little ball of anger but I also feel like there's more to it than that because if you were just fueled by rage I sometimes I do think that that's not always sustainable for long term but I think we're also fueled by just like I do love my my son I do want better for the people that come after and I'm you know the fourth consecutive person to relinquish a child in my one bloodline and so like it's got to stop somewhere right because we can't keep doing this forever I hope not um and so it's it's the love of my family and the love of you know the the first person that started this trend in my in my bloodline the and hopefully I'm the last it's the you know and and you have to not waste it but yeah leave it better than than what you found it as so yeah anyone else have anything to say before we wrap up I would like I would like to ask one more question, Claud Claudia, because uh, it, it shouldn't come at the end because this is a chronologically at the very beginning, but there's part of your story that I remember that while I had you and a few other birth moms that opened my eyes, you had adoptees 
open your eyes. And prior to that, you were not an activist. Can you talk a little bit about listening to adoptees? Definitely. Um, Because I would say that's probably the thing that I've been waving the flag probably the longest, right? Like, listen to the adoptees. You know, I, and, and this is why I also don't put down anybody like how'd you get here, right? Like we all made mistakes get here. We all came with the best of intentions, right? Um, and I, you know, I thought for the first good 12 years that I was, you know, the selfless family building angel, just like anybody else, you know, and I did this wonderful thing for my son. I took the sacrifice and I was willing to take the pain and, you know, I would, I, I was going to do this. And if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, well, you know, at least I had a chance at heaven because I've done something completely selfless to for strangers. Like giving away my kid gives me points, whatever. Um, so I really did believe that, right? And and you know, I I had the mantra, you know, it was the hardest thing I'd ever do, but I'm never gonna regret it, blah, 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 because that's what I was taught, right? I wanted to be the best birth mother there was. And these are the things that birth parents were supposed to say and feel and do. And so me too. Um, and then I Googled adoption and it was the early, early days where we had adoption.com, right. Which was really at that point in time, just an adoptive parent, like, you know, picnic nonstop 24 seven. Um, and there was like alt adoption and, um, adoption cafe. And then MSN had message boards, MSN, was it in MSN? I don't know. Just they had message boards. Um, and there was an adoption message board. And I found my way towards that one. And then there was a friend aside adoption insights message board. And because a lot of people are in both of them, they I went to that one too. <laughs> so the adoption one was a mixed group, and but it was, you know, it was it was, it was definitely was rocking but you know i cut my teeth on there being the happy birth parents still and then i moseyed over to adoption insights thinking that you know same kind of place right and i went into chat one night and there was a bunch of birth parents in there and adoptees and i was doing my little thing and they like ripped me to shreds they ripped me to shreds so bad like well what were your reasons for relinquishing and i was yeah, well, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so you're going to tell your son that, you know, you went to dead shows and you relinquished him because you wanted to go to concerts? What? No. I mean, just everything just got destroyed within moments. Um, and I remember, like, you know, the typical, like, like everybody, like, you guys know, your hands are shaking and you're reading that and you can't even type the letters because you're so upset and you're going to cry and, like, you're so angry at the... How dare they? They don't know me. They don't know... Yeah, okay. Thank you. They know who they are. They still all exist. They are still near and dear to my heart. But yeah, um, so but I kept on doing that, right? And so between these two groups, eventually I found a small group of adoptees that I became friends with. And Callie out in California and little bit Jen. And Samantha, she's still around my peach. Um, but, you know, a, a little handful of them. And 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 I remember one night just saying, you know, we were in chat and, and I was doing my reiteration of, I am the best thing that ever happened. It was the hardest decision I ever made, but I don't regret it. And they went, Claude, promise us. I don't know if it was Callie or Jen. I want to say it was Jen, but it could have been Callie. Promise us. And if you ever do meet Max, you do not say to him that you don't regret it because if you're telling him that that means like for us that means you are okay with missing his entire childhood and i was like oh no i'm not okay with it and they were like yeah and it like literally at that point it was just like like i, I realized at that moment that i had been taught all this other stuff but this one core thing was wrong and so if that important thing of the adoptees that I trusted who was now, and I knew they were speaking for my son, right? I had no access to my child, but I knew that I wanted to prepare for the best, you know, to be the best birth parent, right? I'm still on that, that track, but for, to be the best birth parent, I have to be ready for a reunion because he's going to find me when he's 18, right? Because he's going to be grateful and thankful and want to thank me. Uh -huh. um, 
so I was doing the best I could. I realized I have to listen to these adoptees, right? Because they're going to tell me what I have to do to prepare. And that was like the first thing they said. And I was like, oh, wow, what else do I have to unlearn? Pulled that string, house of cards, start tumbling down. So, yeah. So, you know, it is, and I have to say that is the most, probably, without a doubt, the most important thing. Thank God I learned it early on. Um, but, you know, it ties into everything, right? It ties into not making it about me, right? It's really about them. And I think that is like so vital for anybody doing this work living this life right like when it comes down to it measure what you're doing if you're questioning anything measure what you're doing in the big picture and like in the long run how is this going to affect the adoptee because that's who it's supposed to be about and if we're not doing it to make it better for them then we got no business doing any of it honestly and honestly we need to be asking them what they want us to do which I find very hard sitting back and letting you guys do all these great things. And I want to do them too. And I'm like, no, not about me. It's about you. So. Yeah. Thank you well, so much for the memory lane. I really appreciate it. And I just understand so much more the importance of listening to people. So thank you. Oh, you got that so long ago, Lori, come on. <laughs> you, you are mastered that a million years ago. So. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about this. Um, there's so many good little clips I want to like cut out, um, but so many good little uh, just bits of wisdom and, um, you know, just insight uh, on the past couple of decades. And we, we look forward to much more work coming out of you. You're not done yet. So. No, thank you. I'm not. I am a little tired. <laughs> Right? And, and what's nice is that, you know, other people are doing work now, right? Yep. Um, God, it's crazy to think I'm an old timer now. I'm being such a newbie. Well, we appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. A wonderful way to spend the afternoon. Yeah.